Welcome to the Straight Talk on Fleet podcast with Aaron Gilchrist. Each week, Aaron will be breaking down fleet management, trying to cut through the noise and get down to the real issues safety and operations leaders are struggling with every day. The goal will be to get to the bottom of how leaders can break down these silos of information, accelerate change management, how to use real-time accurate data to drive massive efficiencies across fleet-focused business processes, and to elevate people's careers with emerging best practices. Now it's time for the Straight Talk on Fleet. Okay. Hello again, Fleet community. We're back for yet another episode of the Straight Talk on Fleet. So excited today. We have a guest today, so I'm super pumped. But I'm Aaron Gilchrist, and I am VP of Fleet Evangelism at IntelliShift. And on my podcast, I aim to be your objective and reliable source of information for the fleet ecosystem because I ran an enterprise enterprise size fleet for over 15 years. It was a great time, but it wasn't easy. It was definitely harder than it needed to be. So what I try to do here is break things down fleet manager style with a focus on, well, everything from driver behavior, compliance, to getting more from our internal partners, our external partners, and certainly our data. We talk a lot about that. We'll talk more about that today. On today's podcast, I am so excited to announce that we have the 2022 Corporate Fleet Manager of the Year, Jonathan Kamen's with us. Hi, Jonathan. Hey, Aaron. Thank you. So, so happy. Jonathan and I have known each other for a very long time, and I have watched him excel in all of his roles throughout his career, but so excited. We're fellow fleet managers of the year. I won in 2019, um, which seems like so long ago because we've been through COVID and everything else since then, right? right. And Jonathan won this year. So congratulations first off, Jonathan. Yeah. So Jonathan is the Associate Director of Fleet and Safety for Behringer Ingelheim, and they are a leading research-driven global pharmaceutical company. They create value in, through innovation in the areas of high unmet medical need. They have a hun- over 52,000 employees and 130 markets around the world. So Jonathan has an interesting and big job. So more about you, Jonathan. Um, again, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to join us on the Straight Talk on Fleet. Take a minute to introduce yourself and share with our audience a little bit about what makes you tick. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I appreciate it and uh, look forward to the the time that we have. So, yeah, so as you said, Jonathan Kamen's AD Fleet and Safety for Bering Air Ingelheim. What makes me tick is is actually pretty simple. I like to solve problems and I like saving lives. And from a, a fleet role, you get the opportunity to do both of those. And, and I think that's why it uh, it works so well for me. Yeah, it's so great. And and Jonathan and I have talked many times and this idea of, you know, we run fleets and they burn lots of fuel and they have impacts on the environment, but we get excited about the way that we can reverse that impact and sometimes um, come out on top there in the areas of environmental safety, environmental health, and certainly um, protecting our employees and all those that are out there on the road alongside our drivers. So um, I love that you said that. That's what makes me tick too. So that's perfect. So tell me a little bit about your journey in the industry, sort of how it led you to where you are today. Yeah. So this is probably a really long potential answer. So I'm going to try to shorten it. So I actually okay. started off my career way, way, way long ago um, with Wyeth Pharmaceuticals. So I actually did uh, security and OSHA safety there for a couple of years until I met the fleet manager who I thought was the coolest guy in the world. And you know, he used to talk about all the cool things that they did in fleet. And I was like, okay, I got to figure this out. Anyway, so um, they ended up with an opportunity to kind of reformulate their fleet safety program. And I was into competitive off-road rock crawling in four-wheel drive vehicles and, uh, you know, vehicle dynamics and, and safety and all that good stuff. And ultimately ended up in in that role. Kind of grew up into the fleet manager role when, when you know, the positions changed from fleet manager to fleet director and then fleet director retired. Um, so learned a, a whole lot there. Pfizer ended up purchasing Wyeth. So I left there and went to a small biopharmaceutical company called Cephalon. Within two years, they were then acquired um, by Teva. <laughs> so I figured it was uh, probably time to get out of pharmaceuticals for a little while and uh, took an enormous leap to uh, actually move my family from the Philadelphia area to Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, to go to work for Ingersoll Rand and, and run their fleet. And the big thing for me there was we took a really decentralized fleet organization 
with really large kind of brand names and train and thermo king and club car and centralize those um, into a really efficient uh, process out of davidson north carolina fast forward eight years after that and and some opportunities and left there and went to uh, carolina tractor and equipment and really got to learn the medium and heavy duty side of fleet um, in a really local, non-publicly traded organization, which is a vastly different, Very different. yeah, vastly different <laughs> fleet than, than what you're accustomed to. Yes. But you get to take some of those learnings and, and apply some of them, but you get to learn a whole lot more. And just really looking for that next kind of opportunity. And uh, pharmaceuticals today is, uh, the pharmaceutical fleet is not like what it was. It's not what color is your fusion anymore. Um, there's just so much more data involved and decisions involved. And, even, you know, the last 18 months, global supply chain challenges. So um, here I am at, at Burning at Ringelheim, and I couldn't be happier. Yeah, wow. What a great story. I mean, you stayed sort of in the pharmaceutical industry for a lot of that time. But like you said, so much has changed. And then in recent years, we know that we've been faced with challenges that we could never have imagined. And we'll, we'll get to that. So Recently, we talked about you winning AFLA's 2022 Corporate Fleet Manager of the Year Award. So, so fantastic. Tell tell our audience a little bit about, you know, what you did to be selected, um, some of those successes that got you one nominated and then selected as the ultimate winner. Yeah, I, and I'll share it, it. It was a lot in a really short amount of time. So um, walking into the opportunity at BI, there, there were just a couple foundational things that, that we were missing. Um, that would allow us to then measure our fleet and, and see how you know valuable the fleet program was where we need to make changes. So it actually started with reducing administration into the fleet office. So a couple of years ago, there were four people in fleet. Two years ago, there were actually three years ago, there were two people in fleet. And now it's just me, myself and I and, and my great suppliers. <laughs> but it was really taking all the administration that was coming into the fleet organization and finding the right way to get first call resolution to the employees, right, to the drivers behind the wheel. The second right. enormous piece to that was identifying the driver population. And while that sounds kind of really basic, it drives everything from safety to compliance, right? It, it drives every piece of what you do. So not only understanding what drivers you have, but what do they drive, right? So we now have driver types and it automates the entire downstream process for compliance for each type of driver, whether it's commercial, non-commercial, sales, executive, et cetera. And then connecting wow. internal systems and external systems, right? Like we all, I think we all know data drives everything that a fleet leader does today. So you have to get that data right. And I'll be completely honest, ours was not, right? So the structure that we hired in, in our supplier systems were manually developed and they were manually nursed along. So we took our internal HRMS system, looked at the data hierarchy that existed there, reformulated data feeds, had our suppliers rebuild three years worth of data in their system just so that we could not only go forward measuring, but we could actually go back and rebuild some of those kind of core metrics um, to make sure that we were doing what we needed to do. And we weren't. But yeah, and just making a baseline, creating a baseline by which you could then measure yourself for the future with what a body of work. And, and I mean, that's that's just the beginning, right? You talk about all the benefits there afterwards, right? Billing right? Accuracy and billing, the administrative churn of folks in, you know, in the finance group coming back and saying, hey, these 400 line items failed because you didn't have the right cost center because you weren't automated because you didn't have the connections to your suppliers, right? All of that was part of that kind of transition. And ultimately where we ended up was, you know, one, we had a lot more compliance around our drivers. We understood who our gray fleet drivers were, right? Those people who happen to jump into a company vehicle that typically you wouldn't you know be aware of we built dot compliance which we didn't have and as a pharma company you don't have a lot of it but it's just as important right um so all those pieces allow us to, to recognize some some pretty good process improvements but also financial improvements yeah i know i read about some of these fantastic results i don't know what you can share but i'd, I'd love for you to share with some of these newer fleet managers who might be listening, you know, while it was a huge body of work, there were some huge financial successes. Can you talk about some of the headway you made um, saving your organization 
money in the process of improving all of those things you yep. you were so lucky to do <laughs> walking in the door <laughs> so i was actually just having this conversation with my new boss uh j- just a few weeks ago and so what it allowed us to do was not only you know clean up the data but start measuring specifically with inside our business where do we have gains where do we have losses where have we missed the mark um, but I'm happy to say, right, if you look at the opportunity, even in the global supply chain, we were able to turn vehicles, um, short cycle vehicles during one of the most improved markets. We were able to target those units based off of the financials that we found in our data analytics, right? So ultimately, year over year, I think our fuel increase was somewhere in, in the range of, of three and a half to four million dollars more year over year. But our offset, right, taking advantage of, a, of about a 30% market gain that you typically wouldn't have had, um, we offset $6 million in, in sales and haven't skipped a beat. So at the highest price of fuel, um, essentially year over year, we're, we're at, a, at an even keel. So it's been a huge success. It's amazing. Um, we talk so much about data is our best friend. And, you know, for those out there who aren't using data the way that probably you deserve, it might be your partnership. It might be just learning how data can affect the way that we uh, do everything in our jobs. But certainly when it comes to driver safety and fuel management, the two things that work hand in hand to increase efficiency and reduce your overall fleet costs, you can't be successful in those areas without good data and without the analytics to accompany that. You know, I think that's one of the most critical things and something that you can't do unless things are tied together. So that's why you spend a lot of time on that, I guess. And, and it is a lot of foundational work, but at the end of the day, what that does for the three, four, five years after that foundational work is done, um, it just escalates how quickly you can, you can make impact. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, you had a lot to do in a short amount of time and, and your, your AD of, of fleet and safety. Well, you and I know yep. that fleet managers wear a lot of hats. And even depending on where we roll up in our organization, whether it's procurement or or maybe it's a risk, operations, finance. So talk a little bit about your actual role, because it sounds like you've done a lot of things that were inside and outside of your wheelhouse just to be able to, you know, measure success and and move forward. But talk about your actual with, role within the organization and then how you've rolled up and how that's affected your success. Yeah, we could probably talk a few hours about this. So specifically for me, <laughs> I've actually been part of the HR organization for BI. I've been part of the total rewards organization with BI, and I'm now currently part of the global facilities and engineering organization with, uh, with <laughs> BI. So a lot of changes in a fairly short amount of time, but but all really valuable, right? So. Um, we've talked about before building internal relationships, right? Connecting to every single function inside of the organization that fleet touches, impacts, you know, somebody's decision has impact to a decision in fleet and making sure that you're connected to the folks and that you understand what their priorities are. They understand what your priorities are, find common opportunities and start to build those internal relationships ultimately coming out with a common goal, right? So here's a great one. Environmental health and safety is traditionally responsible for safety in an organization. You and I both know that their core focus is on the job safety, right? It's it's plants and environments that that are are fairly controllable. In the fleet world, it's an uncontrollable factor, right? So you need to be able to use what we call the the data, right, to, to really get you there. Well, fleet managers are, are right for that because we've been utilizing data for so long, identifying where there's opportunity and we apply it to that. But that partnership with EHS has to exist, with risk management has to exist, right? And that for me, I think is the, the biggest takeaway is regardless of where you report into or how many times that changes in, in my situation, um, those internal relationships that you build are the most critical. Yeah, I think, Jonathan, I've, I've said that probably in every single podcast so far. When I had a whole it. podcast devoted to just that, I was talking about project and change management. I'm like, okay, we can have all these great ideas and we have this vision, but if we do not have those internal partnerships, we're dead in the water because we need those folks to not only share their knowledge and their inputs and, and help us as an understand all the ways that what we're going to do is going to affect the organization. 
so yeah, it's been a whole podcast just on that. I swear I could probably do like six Easily. just on um, how critical it is and all those different partnerships. But I love how you said that despite how you rolled up, it was a great learning experience. So Absolutely. that's fantastic. So it's kind of saying to the audience out there, hey, no matter what your circumstances are, make the most of them, right? Take advantage of the relationships within your current roll-up structure, but then reaching out to those other areas in the organization. And real quick, you, you and I both know that not everybody knows what Fleet does. In fact, most people know about that much about what Fleet does. So, you know, your, your title, evangelist, right? Internal to our organizations, we have to be the evangelist to what Fleet does how important it is to the, or, the organization, how every single decision that gets made impacts the downstream events of the organization financially, right? With its customers, every piece of that is important. And we, we have to be the folks who, who ring our own bells. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great point that we have to continue. I, I sometimes used to say, we have to continue to prove ourselves. And that's true. But I like you're taking a more positive spin on it by saying, hey, continue to evangelize in your organizations. Y you have to. People don't understand fleet. So if you're feeling disheartened out there, just keep singing your song, keep telling your story and get everybody sort of in the same room. Absolutely. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, they'll all be singing your song before too long. So good insights there, Jonathan. So, okay, talk about you know, how do you know when you're successful? So what are some of those KPIs that you're using? And then how are you measured? Yeah, so, and it's probably true for most organizations and I'll be completely candid with you, right? So from a fleet perspective, we didn't have a whole lot to be measured on simply for the fact that we didn't have things aligned to measure ourselves. Like financially, we could tell you where we ended up at a, at a cost per mile, or, you know, we could look at, you know, sales and align, align that to the sales. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's on us to create what that value is, right? So for me, you know, I know there's four key, key areas for us to measure on. The first is how do we financially show up, right? Are we generating savings or are we, you know, effectively creating cost? And every decision that we make, it impacts that, right? Whether you measure that at a, at a cost per mile or you measure that at, at a business unit, the idea is just to get that information out there and, and start to measure it, right? The second one for us is, is what is driving the, the cost inside a fleet and how do we impact it, right? So talk briefly about fuel, right? We can't control the cost of fuel. We can control the types of vehicles that we place in and, and that impact. Um, but then how do we offset those, right? So we talked about global supply chain. For me, every panic opportunity is a challenge opportunity, right? I look at that and go, okay, I can't control it. But what can I control, right? So I can control the sales of vehicles. I can, I can identify vehicles in my fleet that we're underutilizing and getting them out, right? Having conversations. At a time when values are good. You know? Never been better, right? Now, I'm not going to take the savings of every vehicle I sell, but if that would have, you know, netted me a 30% increase year over year versus a, a typical market, then that's the value that I get to measure for the organization, right? But the other piece of that is 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 maybe not as... KPI centric, right? So I think everybody knows fleet talking to a driver has very little impact. It's the manager's conversation, the direct manager's conversation and engagement with that employee that changes the way they get behind the wheel. It changes the attitude of which they, you know, they place on driving a company vehicle or care for a company vehicle, right? Those kind of intangibles, yeah. there's measurements behind that but it's really the level of engagement. How do you get managers tied into the data? How do you get them wanting to change that and have those conversations locally? How do you provide tools to those folks to help them drive that change in the organization? And that's really, you know, that's really been, after the, the, the AFLA Awards stuff, right? The foundational really critical stuff, that's really what I'm going after is, is the engagement at the manager level. That's excellent. You know, that's something that took me a really long time to do in my prior role. And it wasn't until I figured out how to help managers and drivers understand what was in it for them and tie the fleet and operational KPIs together yep. so that the manager could go, oh, wow, you know, if I adhere to these fleet policies or these initiatives, they're all there to help my drivers stay safe and to reduce my 
the fleet cost impact on my profit margin. So it's like, wow, the light bulbs went off, but not, it took a while. It, you know? It's cultural, right? And, and anything that you change mm -hmm. that's cultural is going to take time to do. And every person you connect to has to see the value in order to start that cultural change. Um, you know, we, we had talked before, you being able to connect that to what they do every day is what drives that shift in mindset. Yeah, well, if anybody can do it, I know you can. So <laughs> I, I, I know, I know you're going to be super successful with that, um, as you have been at, at all the things you've touched, Jonathan. So tell me about what are your top two to three challenges right now? I mean, what's keeping you up at night? Tell me about you know some solutions that you're thinking about to solve for some of those problems where there are gaps. The things that challenge me probably they're they're not typical to the industry for me, right? So for me, there's there's two core things that, that are a major challenge. One is exactly what we talked about, and that is the engagement at the manager level in all things fleet, right? We say all things fleet, but then we need to prioritize which ones we want them engaged in first and get them coached up, right? That's an enormous undertaking. The second piece for us is we are fairly immature in our driver risk and, and safety program, right? Um, we, we have the right ideas. Our execution is not the best, right? we've probably not provided the right tools and and they're the things that haunt me every single day right every time my phone rings and i don't know the number it gives me that heart palpitation of man we really need to be doing this much much quicker right so that then leads to supplier partners right do you have the right partners in place are you leveraging the right tools are you building a a, a core relationship with your supplier where both of you, you know, have have something in the game, right? Is it a bi-directional relationship? So when you reach out on those rare occasions that you've just got to have them do something for you, are they willing to do it? And, you know, for us, the answer has traditionally been no, we've not been phenomenal partners, but that's where I come in, right? An SRM background, creating those relationships and making sure that not only are we gaining value, but that we're driving value for suppliers. Yeah, that's those are great points. And in this environment, everything's going to be harder, tougher, longer, you know, and I think that in the area, like you said, controlling the uncontrollable, well, you know, the good news is, is there are things that we can control. And in driver safety is something yes. that, you know, you build those partnerships within the org, we can do that. That's something we can do. And it's so important. And it's the most critical thing that we need to do as fleet managers. So, you know, despite what's going on with fuel costs or what's going on, you know, out there with the supply chain, driver safety is something that we, we can always improve and continue to grow and morph within our organization. So that's such good work. So, so real quick, like if there's something I could share with, with the group, right, from a from a historical standpoint, 18 years in in, in fleet. Yes, please. Yeah, so, <laughs> and especially today, right, with the supply chain challenges and OEM changes and discount changes, right, and all, all that impact, market changes and recession years ago, right, all that good stuff, I urge us not to chase the pendulum, right? So when, when the pendulum swings, we go, whoa, look, there it is. We're going to go over here and try to solve for it. And oh, look over here, right? Bring EVs into, into the equation. Stop looking at the pendulum swing and really start to look at what's controllable between the swings. This way, we're not chasing our tails constantly, right? Like today, our priority is one thing. And next year, it's this thing. And two months later, it's this thing. We've got to be the ones saying, I get it. I feel it. We've seen it before. We're going we're gonna to maintain focus right here and control the things that we can. Um, so that is the one thing I want to make sure that, that folks understand, don't chase the pendulum. That's so interesting. You and I, we're, we're cut from the same we cloth. Are. Yeah, I, I feel like each and every episode of my podcast, whether we were talking about fuel management or maintenance or whatever the topic was, I kept coming back to, if you stick to these fundamentals, you can ride the storms of the economic environment, the what's happening in fuel, and even now what's happening with distraction on the roadways, you know, tools and technology, driver safety, engagement, these things are going to be the things that will get you through everything. Agreed. Um, you know, so shiny things, don't be distracted. I, I love it. Yeah, we you're my brother from another mother. For sure. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay. You talked to me recently about this idea of, you know, you spoke about EVs. Yeah. We know we need to be thinking about that. 
And I know that your company has sort of a, a goal. I think I remember you saying 30% EV for your sales fleet by what, 2030? 2030. Yep. You got it. Okay. Talk, talk about that for a minute. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's interesting. Anytime you talk about EVs, right? People think, you know, there, there's no infrastructure for it. And, you know, there, there's no way that we're going to be able to install in, in homes. Understand that 2030 is not tomorrow. So when you break 2030 down, it's two or three life cycles for a vehicle, right? So the answer is not, let's jump in with both feet and, and we've got to go EV today and, and we need to no, negotiate with the OEMs and, and get as much inventory as we can. That's not what this means, right? It, it is a trajectory. So if that means that the vehicle that you replace tomorrow ends up being a hybrid, and then the next version of that vehicle ends up being an EV, that's the goal, right? And in identifying where that ends up, it's not asking who wants an EV, it's using your data to identify the best opportunities that exist for the organization first, getting a survey out to those folks and then saying, oh, hey, we've identified you as being you know, a really great candidate for the conversion to EV. What impact will that have on your life? Are you interested in doing it? If you are, you know, what does your infrastructure look like? Your electrical infrastructure, your home infrastructure? Are you in a, you know, an apartment or a condo, right? And really getting that down to the groups, right? And then the data will actually show you what the next group you get to engage is, what the next group you get to engage is, right? But you create that plan and it looks really, you know, you go from your ICE vehicles down to your hybrid vehicles, and then ultimately you end up with your EVs. And I'll be honest with you, I think 30% um, is a pretty conservative number. I, I think we're probably closer to the 40% of opportunity. And that's what my goal is, right? Regardless of what the, the organization goal is. Well, they just heard you say that. So that's now okay. they're going to hold you to <laughs> <laughs> that that's okay though that's okay yeah. you know and i love it stepping into it and being very thoughtful and calculating engagement again we'll we'll say engagement how many times yeah. because again you need that, that driver buy-in um to do all the things that it'll take for them to be as efficient despite the kind of asset they're driving again it's those fundamentals that'll drive success whether they're in a hybrid or or in an EV or in a in a gasoline vehicle. It's just instilling those same type of, you know, behaviors and fleet fundamentals despite what they're driving. So uh, well, it sounds like you have a good plan to get there. I'll share with you real quick some, some of the some of the interesting feedback just being connected internally, right? So talent acquisition is a is a group that, you know, fleet folks don't generally look at and go, okay, yeah, they're an internal stakeholder. They absolutely are. Um, from our yes. recruitment and retention standpoint. Folks coming into the organization because of their age haven't driven cars or they drive an EV and their expectation when they come to the organization is that there's a solution there for them that engages them to the organization, right? So without mm -hmm. those connections, I don't have that feedback. I don't have that input and they're not part of the group that I'm looking to convert to EV, but it's the easiest group to convert because that's their expectation coming in the door. Yeah, yep. absolutely. That's a great point. Great point. So we've talked about, you know, the economic conditions yep. so much and as an industry and you and I've talked about it before, but you know, you specifically in your organization, how are these, you know, supply chain constraints and economic conditions, fuel costs, how are they affecting your business and your role? And, you know, what are you doing to offset some of these challenges? Yeah, I'm probably going to make folks cringe. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm really That's good okay. with communications, right? <laughs> At the end of the day, folks just want to be in the know, right? So where something like supply chain constraints, add time to a vehicle that you order, reduce options on the vehicle that you order, right? Ultimately, don't provide you with the same level of vehicle that you're accustomed to, right? Where all those impacts exist one as a fleet leader you need to create flexibility right so your vehicle would typically be replaced in this order cycle you have under fifty thousand miles you have two options you can order a vehicle or we'll just add you to the next order cycle with the understanding that we're not sure if that'll change or not but we'll at least defer you it's fifty thousand miles it's not going to impact us significantly but secondarily to that is is really having them understand that when they walk inside the supermarket and they've seen prices change by 30 cents on a can of beans, connecting that to the price of a company vehicle and the financial impact of moving to the same vehicle that you were accustomed to at a much higher price, people start to understand the business decisions that you're making, right? You, you connect that to the volume, right? Okay, we're gonna order a thousand vehicles. 
Let's take that same decision you just wanted to make and apply that to a thousand vehicles and look at what the organizational impact is. Um, so I'll be completely right. candid with you. With the supplier relationships that we have, it has not impacted us negatively at all. In fact, it's presented us opportunities to engage other suppliers, um, to look at other opportunities, um, to find out where we can actually drive value for other OEMs, right? So those things are, are probably yeah. the most important. So do we have different vehicles? Sure. Are we ordering as many? Definitely not. But we're not we're not negatively impacted by the things that are going on in the supply chain. I'm not chasing the pendulum. I'm looking in the middle, <laughs> right? But yes. I'm making sure that we're, we're selling vehicles in the best market that we can that are valuable to the organization and offsetting some of those other cost challenges. So the company fortunately doesn't see a lot of the impact. Yeah. So on that note, yep. you know, for our audience, t tell us about what kind of vehicles you're utilizing. <laughs> you know, that might help them understand how, you know, they might be affected more than you, right? All fleets look and feel a little bit. Different. Yeah, they definitely are. And in, even inside of our, our organization. So for our pharmaceutical sales group, it's primarily you know, small SUV. That's, that's kind of where we live, all wheel drive. On the animal health side of our business, that's where we start to get into light duty truck. And I think most folks understand it's way harder to get a truck today than it's ever been. Um, and certainly much harder than getting an SUV is. Yeah. So, you know, I think that, that so many fleets are, are mixed, different shapes and sizes. And in some segments of their organization, just like you, you're more affected than others. But yep. again, you know, I think the big takeaway for today for listeners is just this whole idea of not chasing the pendulum, right? I mean, and just kind of developing um, strong fundamental fleet practices with engagement as the goal, right? Keeping everyone in the know and not only in the know, but, but helping them learn and grow with you and get involved in the things that are going to help them be successful ultimately through your initiatives. That's good stuff. I'll say real quick, I'll say real quick if you don't mind. So the chasing the pendulum, it, it not only sits with you, folks in your organization are going to chase the pendulum and they're going to expect you to chase it as well. So leverage that, you utilize that, that terminology and let them know, I, I get it, I see it, I understand the impact to it. Here's what we have control over. And, and that will calm them down. It, it will give them a sense that you understand exactly what's going on and that you're a solid partner internally. They'll begin to trust you more. Um, don't let folks chase pen, pendulums. Yeah, that's great. It's a great point about building, um, again, the relationships you build within the organization, how you tell your story really shapes your success, but it also builds that trust inside of the organization. So when they look at you as the fleet leader or the safety leader, or even some of us doing operational things as well, most of us, that they come to know what to expect from you right. and what not to expect. So I think that's a really great lesson for, for especially newer fleet managers out there who are probably more at the mercy of what their organizations are, are telling or asking them to do, despite their instinct to do something different. Even some of the seasoned vets, right? Look, look, I agree for, for new folks is important, but for even for some of the seasoned vets, there's not been a whole lot of volatility in fleet, right? Or those things that impact fleet. There's never been more volatility than what there is now. So chasing becomes yeah. really simple to do. Um, so I think even for the vets, it's, it's a solid takeaway. Yeah. Jonathan, one thing I just want to end with, just because um, I love talking to you and I love your perspective on, on things, just so king for a day, if you could be king for a day. I feel like I'm queen every day. I'm just going with that. That's how I'm going to go. You know, that's okay. how I'm going to operate. But if you were king for a day, just what, what would you do, change, implement? I mean, personally, professionally, anything you want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, I, I probably won't be anybody's favorite with these conversations, but I'll go ahead and put it out there. The, the, the first Please. for me is it's about saving lives, right? So I think there needs to be more penalty on organizations who knowingly turn away from protecting their employees, right? So organizations who are challenged to make decisions in the best interest of their employee because of profit, um, they, they need to be penalized for it, right? So king for a day, that, that's my first hit. The second hit for me is is really relative to the distractions behind the wheel. And I'm not even talking about just the cell phone. The infotainment systems that we have access to while we're driving 
should be dumbed down while there's a human behind the wheel, right? Let's go back to the 1960s and be able to turn up the radio or change the station, but there's no reason for us to be so incredibly engaged in what's going on in the middle of the dash. Given how much we don't have control of on the outside of the windshield, we need to be in, co- in control of that environment. So I think holding the OEMs accountable to ensure um, that they're keeping people safe when, when they're driving a company vehicle is, is probably the second most critical piece to me. So they're my two kings. I love those, Jonathan. That's not only super inspirational, but it's the right thing to do. And, you know, within our industry, we, we do have a voice as fleet we leaders. Do. We're buying a lot of, of tools and tech and equipment and vehicles for our fleets. And I feel like, you know, using our voice to leverage better service, more data and analytics, better data stewardship. And then certainly this last but most important piece is, you know, promoting um, the right things to keep drivers and the public safe. You know, we're not only trying to protect those we're driving around the millions of miles that we're driving as fleets, but we're trying to, you know, look at the outside environment and hope that all of those other drivers on the road aren't going to cause our driver um, harm as well. So all good points, but thank you so, so much for joining us today. So fun, great insights. And to the fleet community, you can reach Jonathan and I both on LinkedIn. We'd be happy to share um, any of our insights, but Jonathan is a wealth of knowledge. So um, I hope that everyone enjoyed our content today and you guys can find us anywhere you, you listen to content, but like or subscribe. We'd love to hear from you as well on today's podcast, but until next time, keep it real, keep it safe for fleet sake. Thank you, Jonathan. Aaron, it's been great. I love talking to you. Thank you. Awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye.